Hello, welcome to Video Game Animation Study. We're continuing a mini-series looking at the five fundamentals of video game animation as proposed by Jonathan Cooper in his book Game Anim, Video Game Animation Explained. So today, we're looking at the fundamental of context. This relates to how an animation will be used by a character or characters. In linear animation, actions for a character will be tailor-made around the scene, methodically produced in relation to what's happened in a story until that point. The story of a linear animation will likely shape the current animation of a character. Sometimes an animator won't know when an animation will be used by a character or player, or multiple characters, unless it's a very specific animation for a scene or character. We've mentioned in the fluidity video that there are mathematical ways in-game to blend actions together, such as landing from a jump. But when it comes to physically animating this character by hand, you have to treat each action as though it's playing for the first time by itself. A lot of the time, this also means that one animation will be used across a variety of settings and possibly characters. Back in the day, this was all game developers could do due to hardware limitations. You might occasionally see a special animation like Mega Man X breathing heavier when low on health, or Samus struggling to stand when near death. But generally, animations played as they were designed, and they were designed to be standalone actions that simply played when needed. Nowadays, it's easier to work this stuff in, such as our main character in Greece moving much more slowly in the beginning of the game due to the prior circumstances, and characters moving slower due to low health and such. Something a game animator will have to consider when creating motion for a character is whether that motion will be specifically for that character or for a number of characters, both playable and non-playable. Jonathan calls this distinction versus homogeneity. It is something that a game character animator will have to know before animating. But it will greatly help the animator decide how much personality to imbue a character animation with. Let's take our DC hero for this miniseries, Batman. By now, Batman's personality in any medium is fairly consistent, so giving his character movements some distinction will be a firm green light, and relatively easy to do. He has broad shoulders from a straight back, confident footsteps, a stern reservation, and his run still reflects this, just with a bit more energy. His leaps and punches are firm and direct, and you can feel that he's working with all this armour on. These flourishes have been designed specifically for Batman. When you play as Catwoman, her actions are quite effeminate, with that traditional sexy hip sway when walking, reflecting the slinky movements an actual cat might make. And with the lack of utensils compared to Batman, her movements are swifter. And these flourishes have been designed specifically for Catwoman. Without getting into gender politics here, it's safe to say that the animations for the two characters were tailor-made to be distinct. Now let's compare this to the thugs and criminals you beat up throughout the game. There will be varied animations depending on if they're carrying a weapon and what that weapon is, but you'll find they all move the exact same way, especially if you catch them running. When creating these actions, it's very likely the game animator or animators were given the task of creating thug animations. Animations that would be applied to all street thugs. Ideally, you'll want to reduce the distinction on non-player characters, so it gives your main character a chance to shine and stand out. You'll see this all over the place. I'm sure you've been at a point in a game where the enemies are making the exact same animations at the exact same time. Now obviously this will be a huge time, money and labour saving technique, and rarely will you notice it quite this much. But it's interesting to note that in one way or another, NPCs will often have the same non-distinct animations. You may find that there could be groups of NPCs that have their own distinct animations, while still being homologous within that group. You may notice during GTA V that all the main characters, despite having different personalities, all move in the exact same way but they're still vaguely distinctive from the NPCs you'll find wandering around. This isn't such a massive deal, as they're all at least male between 20 and 50 years old. It'd be another matter if another character was massively different from the others, as a slight tweak in the animation settings would likely be necessary. 
But this begins to creep into elegance territory, which we'll cover in the next and final episode. Now, this begins to get quite technical, but it's something Jonathan explains in great detail in his book. Additive poses are pre-made separate poses and animations, which can be added to another animation, either fully or in part. For instance, a walk cycle could have another animation added over the top, mathematically, to result in a different looking animation, such as being low on health or looking around. This video from the channel Pangloss is exactly what I'm talking about. So without learning 3D software, I'm just having to show this video to demonstrate what Jonathan means from his book. You can do this with other actions like crouching or heavy breathing, and you can alter by how much you apply this overlaid animation. This may be how differing animations are achieved with the same model. Similarly, additive actions can be overlaid to repetitive animations to give them a less repetitive feel. Initially, you'll want your looping animation, whether it's an idle, run, climb, or anything like that, to be as seamless as possible with no identifying factors, like a noticeable arm swing or something. But then you can add things like crouching, while moving, hunched, tired, things like that, to make it seem more unique. As with the previous fundamental of readability, context also takes into account how closely or distantly an animation will be seen, with subtler movements reserved for close-ups and exaggerated movements reserved for far away. When a game animator is working on a game character, it's difficult to constantly see the desired result of how it turns out in-game, so quite often, particularly with additive poses, it means some guesswork. Things that may alter how an animation looks in-game will be the previously mentioned camera placement, but also the camera field of view. If a character is close to the edge of the screen, depending on what lens the camera is set to, this could distort the character model, and this is something the character designer will have to consider too. So, ultimately, it's a smaller topic to discuss, for me right now at least, but a very important one when designing the motion for a character in a game. Knowing where your animation will be used will greatly affect how you approach designing it. Whether it's for the main character, two distinct main characters, a collection of main characters, or a group of NPCs. When a character is walking on different terrain, low on health, or close or far from the camera. This is the fundamental of context, knowing where your animation will be used. This video was sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community that allows you to learn from industry creative veterans, and it's wicked what you can accomplish. You can use Skillshare whenever you want, so if you're like me with a family and a job, it's great to get stuck into when you've got those spare minutes. It's also cheaper than one-to-one -one real world classes, coming in at less than £10 a month when bought annually. I use Skillshare when I want to brush up on my Blender skills as I'm trying to learn more 3D software. That might help with like game development stuff down the line. This class, Motion Graphics in Cinema 4D, Design an 80s inspired anime GIF by Gustavo Torres, focuses on Cinema 4D, so I'd recommend that if you're looking to learn something awesome and new. So the first 500 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. And thanks to my patrons for this one as well. See you next time for the last episode in this series, Elegance. Love you, bye.